Dr. Michu Kaku. Right, right here. How are you, sir? Right Opie and Anthony, of course. Now, uh, we were going to ask you about the volcano, but uh, we got into, once again, the 9-11 discussion. It's so frustrating to us, but Willie Nelson was on Larry King, and he's suspicious, and he thinks that uh, it was a controlled freaking explosion, and the building imploded, and blah, blah, blah. Could you give us, could you give us 30 seconds on that to shut up okay. everybody? Okay. Hmm. So, uh, what do you want to know? Well, like, why, why, why uh, would people think this is a controlled explosion when obviously planes flew into this building and the effects of fuel on the uh, steel uh, brought this down? I don't understand yeah, well, how people can't understand that. Two reasons. Okay, first of all, everyone's been brainwashed by seeing all these controlled demolitions. <laughs> we see it on television all the time. Mm -hmm. And so when we see the World Trade Center go down, we say, aha! Just like I've seen on all the videos on TV. Well, these people don't know anything about controlled demolitions. Mm -hmm. Controlled demolitions are done from the bottom. You put dynamite on the bottom of the building, not the top. You'd have to be an idiot to put dynamite on the top <laughs> of a building and have it implode, right? Yes. But the World Trade Center went top down, not bottom up. Right. Okay? But these people don't know that because they see all these videos on TV. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, as was said by one well, woman commentator on her show, uh, fire does not melt steel. Mm -hmm. And she said that over and over again on her nationally syndicated talk show. <laughs> yes. Fire does not melt steel. Well, duh, everybody knows that fire does not melt steel. However, it weakens steel, softens it, so that the, the softening of steel will buckle, will cause right. it to buckle under pressure. Yep. It has nothing to do with melted steel. It has to do with buckling steel. Weakened steel cannot hold all that concrete. That's and, right. and, and that's it. That's all you need is weakened that's, that's steel. It. That's it. Oh, those people. Uh, How uh, come it takes a theoretical physicist to explain common sense to people? It's, <laughs> but, yeah. But they'll ignore <laughs> what Michu Kaku is saying today, and they'll, they'll continue down this dumb of road. Course. And you also yeah, taught some us... Some people are ideologically married to a certain point of view. Nothing nothing you tell them is going to change their point of view. Nothing. And, and you also taught us that most buildings are made of uh, air. Most of the building is made of air. Yeah, the reason why it went into free fall is, of course, it went into free fall. The building is empty, for God's sake. I mean, how, how <laughs> Relatively the speaking. can yeah. float yeah. if yeah. battleships are empty? Right. right. Yeah. There you go. I'll sing. All right. All right. This uh, now we saw you on uh, TV earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, you're turning into the, the you're turning into the go to guy, huh, Doctor? Yes. Michu Kaku. Well, you know, people want to know about you know what, what natural phenomenon about physics and about reality. So that's that's what I try to provide. You know. What do the laws of physics say about the universe, about uh, our own backyard? Now, there's uh, – there's oh, we should ask him about the meteor as well. But, yeah, that too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, The volcano, what, what's your take on the whole thing? I, I hear there's another volcano right next door that could erupt and it's and, yeah, and is due. that's right. See, the, the good news is that maybe this will be a simple repeat of 1821. Oh. In 1821, the same volcano blew up, and it, the eruption lasted for 13 months, but it sputtered. It's Flooded over 13 months, came on, came off. That, that's a good scenario because eventually the ice will melt, and ice is what makes this volcanic eruption so bad. The worst-case scenario is that the Laki volcano, L-A-K-I, which is nearby, could erupt because of this eruption, like in 1783. Mm. That eruption killed one quarter of the population of Iceland, <laughs> mainly due oh, to starvation. I thought he was about to say the world. <laughs> Over 50% of all livestock were killed by that eruption, causing mass famine. And in Europe, it caused tens of thousands of deaths throughout Europe, aggravated the collapse of agriculture for several years in Europe. Some historians say that helped to precipitate the French Revolution of 1789, because the French peasantry were impoverished because of that volcanic eruption. So that's the worst-case scenario, is if this eruption sets off a neighboring eruption, and this other volcano is much bigger than mm. this volcano, which is actually quite small, by the way. This is a small eruption aggravated by ice. And it's easier to say, Blackie. That's yeah. an easy volcano to pronounce. <laughs> yeah, we're not even attempting that to pronounce That other one, it. wow, that's tough. Yeah, that's too, too big. Too big of a word for us, sir. Yeah. Uh, so, but Lockie is overdue, too, right? Uh, well, it's overdue. These cycle times are mentioned in centuries. The last big one was 1783. Benjamin Franklin was in Paris, by the way. He saw the whole thing happen. The whole the skies darken. 
I, it was called the year without summer. The and entire summer was knocked out. I hear the rest his of itself uh, lasted eight months. I hear his plane was uh, delayed uh, coming back to the United States, also, right? Yeah, that's right. They were going to put his face on the money, and they had to delay that flight. Yes, <laughs> yes, indeed. Now, uh, the a lot of people stranded. Now, I mean, how long are these people going to be stranded? How how long is this going to spew this much ash and debris into the atmosphere? Well, it could last days and weeks. Uh, the best case scenario is if the ice mainly melts, in which case the, ag- the, the eruption is over. Ice aggravates the whole situation. Scientists are going there right now to try to find out how much ice is left. You see, when molten lava goes through ice, it causes explosions. It causes glassifying silica, mm. and that's what's aggravating this explosion because this explosion is actually a rather minor eruption as far as eruptions go. Once the ice is gone, the eruption will be harmless. So it's like putting one of those frozen turkeys in the boiling oil. Look out. Uh, yeah, it's splatter. You get explosions. Yeah. You get mm-hmm. classification of silica. And this, this thing is like uh, industrial-grade sandpaper. If it goes into an engine, it just chews up the engine, uh, melts, resolidifies, gums up the blades. Mm-hmm. And in 1982, a plane almost went down when all four engines conked out when it went through a cloud like this. Oh, wow. We that's, don't want that. Yeah, that's pretty frightening. So, yeah. Uh, you're, and, you're, you know, you're some people say, why not fly under the cloud? <laughs> well, there's a danger there. Parts of the cloud are invisible, and when it hits your windshield, it sandblasts your windshield. <laughs> I mean, what is sandblasting out after all? Yeah. Sandblasting is taking industrial-grade particles and slamming it into glass, right, and, and stone. That's what happens when an airplane goes through volcanic so ash. You pretty much blind them. You mm. blind them, right? One pilot actually had to land an airplane by sticking his head out Inside the cockpit Old because his windshield was sandblasted by a volcanic ash. Wow. And, and now we got this, uh, this meteor that was seen over, um, where was that, Wisconsin? Yeah, in Midwest, right. It was a rather, a rather uh, it's on the Internet. You can see. Yeah, uh, very bright. You know, the, the impact. Lit up the sky. I was very surprised at the length of time that this thing was lit up. They said uh, they, they started seeing it a good 15 minutes before it really came uh, through the atmosphere and, and really got bright, that seems to be a long time for this thing to be um, heated up in the atmosphere. Well, we do have a telescope in Arizona. It's the only one we in the do? world that is capable of actually seeing the meteor before it actually hits the ground. Oh. It was successful last year. For the first time in history, it actually recorded a meteorite, a meteor as it hit the atmosphere then, of course, people on the ground saw it explode in the air, and then people picked it up off the ground. It was in Sudan. So all three stages, in outer space, hmm. in the atmosphere, and landing on the ground, all three stages were documented. The first time in history, just a few months ago. How long would we have uh, advance notice for the theoretical planet killer um, type uh, asteroid or uh, meteor? Um, how, how much uh, warning would we have that something that could be devastating to the planet is uh, on its way? Well, asteroids, big ones, are very easy to track because you go in circles around the sun. Mm-hmm. The comets from the Oort cloud, way, way out there, they're the most dangerous because as they approach the sun, they're, they have irregular orbits, uh, you know, periodicity 10,000 years, 20,000 years. And when they approach the sun, they have no tail because they're covered in soot. Once they go behind the sun, then the soot so it blows off, sprouts the tail, and then you got a few weeks warning before it kills you. Oh, that's one. A few weeks that's warning before it kills scenario. you. A few weeks. <laughs> a few weeks, huh? Wow. That isn't and enough it, time to do anything, considering we don't even have shuttle, a shuttle program. We've been brainwashed to think that the space shuttle can reach a comet or asteroid. Mm-hmm. Wrong. The space shuttle simply spins circles around the Earth. Very low orbit. Go into deep space. Yeah, low orbit. Um, yeah, is, is, there, is there anything that we have available on the planet right now that would be able to be used to defend against something like that? Uh, We would have to use some of our planetary probes. They can actually go into deep space, but it takes weeks and months and years to get some of these rockets assembled and pointed in the right direction. Remember, the the space shuttle can only go in circles around the Earth. Right. You have to have one of our planetary probes that goes out to Mars and places like that. Yeah, that would be one a little those rockets. Too, that would be a little too late if uh, you know to get it in kind of low Earth orbit. Uh, you'd have to attack that thing um, while it's pretty far out there, huh? 
That's right. You want to nudge it out of the way. Blowing it up like what Bruce Willis would want to do is the worst thing you want to do because then you get all these baby asteroids coming at you. Oh, we can't send a drilling team there to uh, <laughs> drill, <laughs> yeah. drill and put a, a atomic bomb in there, huh? <laughs> that, yeah. That's the worst thing to do because, you know, these asteroids may be collections of rocks that are held together by gravity. So they may not even be solid. And so by blowing mm. it up, you have lots of mini asteroids coming at you. So what you'd have to do, in essence, is have some type of propulsion device to attach to this thing and kind of push it uh, out of the way. Well, the cheapest way to deflect it is to simply paint it. Shoot a, shoot a rocket that simply spray paints, you know, like graffiti. Uh, gr- graffiti is the asteroid. That changes its absorption of sunlight, causes a slight pressure because of sunlight pressure, and oh. nudges it out of the way as it slowly whips around the sun. Almost like one of those uh, light bulb looking things with the black and the white on each side, and it spins around because uh, the the black is absorbing uh, uh, heat. Yes, yeah, sort that, of. Is except, that kind of that thing actually goes in the opposite direction? It, it's the heating of one one a plate versus the other side that causes it to spin. But yeah, in general, if you ca- if you paint an asteroid far far away. It will absorb more energy and deflect it a bit. You know, you can actually calculate. Sent an MS-13 pressure. up there, yo. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. That's wow. Spray deep, paint you know. it. Spray paint wow, it. I never, even, I never heard that one. What about things like uh, solar sails attached to it? Yeah, you could do that. There have been a number of proposals. Another one is to actually use the gravity as a tractor beam, the gravity of a rocket ship to push it out of the way. Uh, another ingenious mm. way is to shoot a laser beam at it, which will vaporize laser. the surface of the rock, causing a jet. And the jet will then push the asteroid out of the way. All right, okay. Yeah, mm, so laser interesting. Beams, spray paint, uh, the gravity of a tractor beam rocket. Um, all of these have been looked at, but they're all very expensive, and they're many, many decades away. And it would be, we uh, yeah. Ducks. So we're sitting here we're pretty sitting much ducks. biding That's our great. time, hoping nothing happens until we do have the technology available uh, That's wonderful. Uh, hey, to, what, to, to work on that. Wow. What do you think about the shuttle program ending there? Well, I'm not happy about it, but, mm. you know, we are in an economic crisis. I just hope the Russians don't get um, uppity and, you know, use an excuse in the Balkans to shut off our space program. Yeah, exactly. I, I find uh, it kind of embarrassing that us yeah. as a country have no way of getting our astronauts up uh, to a space who, station that we really have, paid for. Right. Who would have thought? Who would have thought that after all the billions spent on the race to the moon and yeah. the Russians, that we wind up paying the Russians fifty million per astronaut, yep. fifty million per astronaut for access to outer space. Who would have thought that? I, I think that's, that's crazy, I, I, and I, I find it very uh, disheartening as an American, and um, and just uh, embarrassing that uh, you know we, all these cuts now, especially in NASA. It doesn't even look like in the near future we're going to have a, a craft to take astronauts up there on our own. Yeah, and some people are saying that NASA is the agency to nowhere, and. <laughs> The astronauts are astronauts to nowhere. I mean, where are they going to go? Now, the recent press conference by Obama did allay some fears. He finally said, we're going to go someplace. We're going to go to an asteroid in 2025 and maybe Mars in the mid-2030s. Who knows for sure? Mm -hmm. But, you know, some people are saying, well, where's where's the beef? Okay, you want to go there. That's fine. But where is the beef? Where is the money? You know, yeah, that's, that's I've, I've, I've always just thought that um, the space program here in this country has been a, a source of pride and a source of uh, new technology that, that, that we've gotten that we use on a daily basis uh, um, from the space program. I mean, I don't think you could go through a day without using numerous items that have been used uh, for, on the space program and invented directly because of the space program. And it's just a shame to... Uh, see something that's that important to our country, um, uh, just go to the wayside. Yeah, you know, we are uh, so dependent on outer space, uh, telecommunications, the Internet, Mm -hmm. GPS, weather satellites. um, All of that goes through satellite technology. And, you know, we take it for granted until there's a solar flare or something that it it, it affects our satellites. Uh, We take it for granted. And the economy, a good chunk of the economy goes through outer space. Parts of this radio transmission yeah. <laughs> go through yeah. space. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, look, hey, we're just going to have to get used to the fact that after 2020, the Chinese are going to plant the, a flag on the moon saying that the Chinese have gone to the moon. Okay, if you're, if you're okay with that, okay. 
you're going to have to get used to it. Mm. Used to the fact that other nations are going to leapfrog ahead. Yeah, Hopefully, a, like Obama that. will say something more definite about what he wants NASA to do. Yeah, I think he but just put right a band aid on everybody. Nowhere. I yeah. think he was just putting a band aid on everybody's. Uh, you know, opinion of um, uh, his cuts. I, I, I don't like it. I And I think it does take away from, from jobs and new technology that um, make new products that, again, makes new jobs. And, and I, I think NASA is a very important uh, agency for our country. And I, I, I hate the fact that um, we don't have a ship. Uh, the budget's been cut. And um, yeah. I don't know. I it's mean, just, it's see, embarrassing. The problem is cost. It costs $10,000 to put a pound of anything into near-Earth orbit. That's your oh, weight in gold could be a to put you in near-Earth orbit. To go on the space shuttle costs about $50 million to go on the space shuttle, mm. just to go around the Earth. So it is expensive. My personal point of view is that we should look at non-chemical means of going into outer space. Oh, then now that's uh, what, like, um, what are you talking? Maybe magnetic rail firing us up there? Something even easier. Let's say you have a laser rocket, laser beam on the Earth, so you don't have to put the laser into space. It's on the Earth. You shoot a laser at a payload, which contains water. The water boils. Water is harmless. Hmm. And as it boils, it shoots out one end, and only the payload goes into outer space. Why is space travel so expensive? Because the chemical rocket has to put itself into outer space. Yes, yeah, and, but, and, and that's very, uh, yeah, that's the heaviest part. God, he just simplifies. Dr. Yeah, Kaku wants to do one of those pump-up water rockets, I, I, that's pretty much, is <laughs> what he's suggesting. <laughs> now, hey. Prototypes of this have been fired successfully. They're small prototypes, but you can use ground-based lasers, lasers on mm. the ground, which do not have to go into outer space, to energize water, so it boils, to shoot the payload, just the payload, Dr. into Kaku. outer space. He loves his lasers. On a small scale. Lasers. Does Dr. Kaku love his lasers? Going back to basics. Now... Unfortunately, uh, this guy didn't hear your 2012 discussion, but basically, uh, Michu Kaku saying the 2012 uh, thing is all bullshit. It's bunk. Right, Dr. Michu? Give a- well, you see, the Mayans did say something about 2012. It's a day, it's a time of celebration. It's their New Year's. But I think Westerners have hijacked, hijacked the calendar for their own purposes. In the Mayan culture, there's no history of apocalypse. That's a Western concept. In, in the East and also in, in uh, these societies, uh, what they celebrate is the renewal. The renewal of the seas is not the end of the world. That's a Western concept being imposed upon an ancient Mayan time of celebration. Mm. We're, supposed to, we're supposed to celebrate in 2012. There's so, so many. Yeah, people love interpreting things and then spreading it around like it's fact or just because insane. they make money on it. Think of all the books that have been written by 2012. Movies. Right? Yeah. Big business, 2012. Movie People are making a lot of books. Sure. Anyone can write a book because anyone can say, well, the Mayans meant this, the Mayans meant that. But if you actually go to what the Mayans had, they had a calendar that is cyclic, and it's nothing but a new cycle. But mm-hmm. it makes for a good copy. You can make a lot of money saying that that's the end of the world. Now, obviously, uh, 2012 BS. Uh, what's the one thing we got to worry about as humans? What's the next big thing? And uh, you're, you, you told us last time a, uh, an earthquake taking out a city, a major city. A tsunami. A tsunami. Like that, right? Yeah, well, if you take a look at disasters now, okay, yeah. um, volcanic, volcanic eruptions take place on the scale of centuries. But earthquakes, you know, we are overdue for a big one in California mm-hmm. and Tokyo and Istanbul and so in our lifetime, in our lifetime, we'll probably see one or more of these great cities reduced to near rubble, uh, and we're just going to have to prepare for that fact. Another possibility now on a scale of centuries is a gigantic solar flare from the sun that wipes out all communications, satellites, and our power supply. Mm. Like what happened in 1859, this is called the Carrington event, it was the largest solar flare ever ever recorded because of course we didn't have electricity before yeah, yeah. Before that period of time we had telegraph wires but you could read the newspaper at night in cuba because of the aurora borealis in, in cuba, cuba in oh, 1859 so this is unprecedented so that would be devastating because we know people if you take their technology away for any length of time um we're going to revert back to being animals <laughs> pretty quickly. That's right. Look, take a look at electricity. Without electricity, food rot. You'd have food riots within mm-hmm. three days. 
uh, and no rescue crews from outside because they're paralyzed, too, with food riots. Uh, governments could collapse. Uh, and the physicists have estimated the damage of another Carrington event. And, again, we don't expect it to happen for quite a while. Mm -hmm. However, it would be about $2 trillion, $2 trillion damage wow. to the world economy if it knocks out power supplies, transformers, power stations simultaneously, and all satellites simultaneously going out because the sun has a temper tantrum. We are kind of at the mercy of uh, nature, you know, this uh, planet and uh, the solar system. Mm -hmm. and, well, you know, so we think we're so hot, right? Yeah. But Mother Nature says, ha, you humans are puny to what I can do. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it really is amazing. Sometimes when you get these cataclysmic events, you realize how actually small they are on a planetary scale, but how devastating they are locally to the people that it happens to. And uh, you realize, yeah, if something bigger were to happen, um, that could really screw up uh, civilization. No, right. And, and some people think that maybe Mother Nature is having revenge on us because we have all these <laughs> earthquakes happening in a row. Now we have a gigantic volcanic eruption. But if you think about it, earthquakes and volcanic eruptions happen all the time, but right. mainly underwater. Underwater. Oh, yeah. Well, we forget that there's no CNN underwater. There's no peoples to die underwater. But the Earth erupts all the time with earth monster earthquakes, monster volcanic eruptions underwater. That's only on the fish news, and I don't get that uh, <laughs> on my cable network. So it's provider. not that we're having more earthquakes. It's that they're happening uh, in places where we care about. Yeah. Yeah, so what happens is, you know, we are encroaching on Mother Nature. That's what's really happening. Mother Nature is not angry at us. We are encroaching upon her. You know, back in 1821, when that volcano blew up in Iceland, there were no transatlantic flights. Right. And in 1783, uh, Benjamin Franklin didn't mind being stranded in Paris because ships were unaffected by what was happening in the atmosphere. And rumor has it he did like his women. <laughs> so now we are encroaching on Mother Nature. So we're going we're gonna to find more of these things. We're going to have more earthquakes killing people, mm -hmm. more, more encounters with volcanoes because of progress. Because of progress, because we have more technology that we didn't have 100 years ago. Wow. And what about that Yellowstone thing you mentioned one time on our show? Is it an earthquake under Yellowstone? Well, okay, there is a monster supervolcano okay. under Yellowstone. Okay. We don't know when it's going to erupt. It erupts on a scale of hundreds of thousands of years. However, if you do go back, you know, about half a million years, you find eruptions that are just cataclysmic. If it were to happen, it would destroy the United States of America as we know it. It would just basically take out the entire middle of America. But again, these eruptions take place on a scale of hundreds of thousands of years, not, not hundreds of years, not decades, but hundreds of thousands of years. So it's very hard to predict. There's also another supervolcano in the Canary Islands. If it collapses simultaneously, it will create a landslide that will push water into a tsunami, the tsunami will then go across the pond called the Atlantic Ocean and devastate Boston, New York, Washington, D.C., or Boswash, as we call it. Boswash. So that is a doomsday scenario, two doomsday scenarios. Again, you know, their cycle time is on a scale of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years. Yeah, well, yeah, it's like spinning the wheel, though. It's got to happen sometime. <laughs> yeah, it's inevitable. It's inevitable that, yeah. that Yellowstone will blow up at some point, and that's what's going to, if you can simply put fast forward on the videotape, hit fast forward, look thousands of years in the future, you'll see that the Video guts table. of America will be taken out. Mm. Well, that's wonderful. Well, Dr. Kaku, uh, thank you again for uh, enlightening us and our listeners. And You're you always a... more on the oh. Science Channel. Of uh, course. I post uh, Sci-Fi Science on the Science Channel. Absolutely. I love the show, by the way time you're uh you're very entertaining and uh very interesting um with the uh the subjects that you cover and and some of those theories and everything i love it love dr okay. kaku's show dr kaku when can we look forward to a new season of sci-fi science mm. oh well yeah we're filming it right now even as we speak we're in the middle of filming the second season the second season debuts in uh, fall of this year. Yes. Very cool it's the number one show on the science channel yeah it's fantastic you're beating out how it's made <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a tough that that's a tough one to beat. Uh, I like that one too. Yeah, all right. yeah that's good. <laughs> Dr. Michu Kaku, always a pleasure. Thank, Thank you so you, much, sir. sir.
Okay, thank you. All right, there he goes, Dr. Michu Kaku. Dr. Michu Kaku. I Very love we, interesting. I love when we touch on, like, like you slip in a sexual thing or yeah. a curse, and he doesn't acknowledge he it whatsoever. He he like, like it never happened. He doesn't even hear it. Uh, I wanted words, to, he hears everything else but. wormhole. Right. <laughs> I wanted to talk about Ben Franklin and how he invented bifocals <laughs> so he could lick a g- French girl's pussy and look at her tits <laughs> just by looking up and down because he has such he a horn dog. <laughs> Dude, reading had nothing to do with it. That guy loved his French chicks, and he wanted to like be able to see the clit, so he'd look down his nose, and then he looks up at the titties <laughs> through the top part. And look at her eyes to see yes, if she's enjoying it. Of course. See if he has to make any adjustments. Ben, ben was a horn dog. <laughs> that motherfucker. Writing love letters. Yes. Right across the, across oh. the ocean. Did he love his French pussy? Oh.